get done. Um, this is the second of two talks on organics in the speaker series that's hosted by Zero Waste Oxford. Zero Waste Oxford is an action team of future Oxford. And today we're going to talk about how you can save money on your food budget, how local farmers can find free fodder, how community and charity groups can do good work and raise money. And all of these um, are about helping you, your neighbors, and the environment by also reducing food waste. Mm. Um, so, yes, it's being recorded. Um, if you want to ask a question and want to remain off air, we'll turn off the recording a few minutes before the end as well. So, another chance for you to talk live to us. We've also picked a random number, um, and I'm going to record somebody's name that responds to that random number. Um, okay, got it? Because that random number is going to get a cookbook um, all about pumpkin recipes. Surprise, surprise. Um, and so, um, uh, we'll let that person know at the end. We're not revealing that now um, in case that person didn't want to go public. As I said previously, second in our mini series, um, in our other episode from August the 22nd, a different set of guests talk about how to save money and raise better vegetables and flowers in gardens through composting and food waste digesters. It's available to listen to via the futureoxford.ca site. Um, and there's a link then to YouTube so you can watch that as well. Turn it over to Carrie. Thanks, Brian. So, um, well, hello, I'm Carrie Gill. Thank you, Brian. Brian is my lovely co host. Um, and I volunteer with Zero Waste Oxford, uh, which is the group hosting tonight, but also uh, with Transition to Less Waste. It's a local not for profit. You may have heard of it before. Um, and we try to empower, empower others to reduce not only food waste, as we're talking about today, but also reduce the single use dishes, cups, cutlery at community events with a dish loan program. Uh, and we can talk about later um, if there's time for that. But our guests tonight have a great deal of information for you. Each will answer a few questions from our moderators and afterwards engage in discussion with those live here tonight. Throughout the panel discussion, you're welcome to type your questions into the chat and we'll try to address those to the specific guests when we have time. Thank you, Brian. So, so even if it sounds a bit like a superhero and a mascot, here we go with the great pumpkin rescuer and the food forwarding ox. Our guests tonight are Tom Butler of Tom's Organics, as well as Butler Hops and Garlic, and of a cool school, and Janine Jones of Food Forward Oxford, as well as Holly Brown of um, Oxford County Libraries, who's doubling up as both a guest and a co-host during the extra work. So we're gonna start with the great pumpkin rescue. We have Tom Butler with us to talk about that rather extraordinary set of interventions that occurred in early November. What did you hear about the Great Pumpkin Rescue and what did you think it was? Sorry, Brian, I uh, you were kind of cutting out there for a second and I'm just trying to find the questions. Uh, da, 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 it's about the Great Pumpkin Rescue and what did you think a Great Pumpkin Rescue question. was? Sorry, I'm just trying to find it here. Uh, so, uh, the great pumpkin rescue. So, um, I heard about, uh, the idea from a friend, some sort of hippie friends of mine in Toronto, they were living in the beaches area and I was actually over at their house for a Halloween party. And, um, I, I heard the next day or a, a few days later that she had gone around to her neighbor's house in Toronto neighbors, uh, meaning multiple and sort of collected the pumpkins that they had left on their porches. And she then, you know, uh, processed them, froze them and had a supply of, uh, frozen pumpkin to turn into soup and whatever else, um, in her freezer that probably lasted her all winter long. So I sort of thought like, that's actually a great idea, you know, taking these pumpkins that the people, uh, had on their porches, that they probably had no clue, uh, or weren't even thinking about turning them into food for themselves. And uh, she just took the initiative. I don't know if she, I think she asked them if she could have them, but she may have kind of just done a little bit of porch bandit uh, type stuff where she was helping herself potentially. But um, so that's where I originally got the idea and we brought it to Woodstock uh, after that. Yeah, okay. So I know that there's some other farmers who were doing pieces or versions of it too. What attracted you to a great pumpkin rescue? 
Well, I've, um, you know, always been conscious uh, of waste, how much I produce and things like that. And that we were, I, I was a former member of uh, WEAC and we were always trying to think of ideas of uh, waste reduction as well as other initiatives in town. So I thought it just fit perfectly since we were volunteering on the committee just um, to try and introduce it to Woodstock and see uh, how it would do, uh, sort of thinking about taking these pumpkins that formerly would have either gone into a compost heap or potentially to the landfill and, uh, you know, turning them into a, a resource. I'll just translate the acronym WEAC. It's the Woodstock Environmental Advisory Committee. Tom was a former member of that. And did you expect that after yes. being a member of that you would become a group end up doing? Uh, okay, sorry, Brian, you keep cutting out when you're asking the questions. I think I have it there. Uh, did you expect to become a great pumpkin rescuer? No, I didn't expect that. But what happened was um, the first two years of the great pumpkin rescue, what we did was uh, I just collected pumpkins on my front lawn. So I, I tacked a few skids together in just sort of a big crate and um, we advertised it and people came from I'm sure all around Woodstock and dropped pumpkins on my front lawn. So I think the first year we we had sort of a four by four crate and we probably filled that uh, overflowing at least four times or so. And then the next year I made it a little bit bigger and uh, we probably did the same thing. So I wasn't expecting it and it got, it got to be within two years, there seemed to be a lot of interest. A lot of people were very um, supportive of the idea and it it kind of outgrew my front lawn my lawn in town we have since moved but uh, it was on a bit of a slope so there were times where people were piling pumpkins on my front lawn and they started to kind of roll down our lawn onto the street so I guess it was uh, it was time for it to advance to something else uh, beyond beyond just a, a personal collection on a, a private property in the city Mm. It's hard to quantify, but how many pumpkins do you think are being diverted from waste to become food or fodder? I would think, I, I don't know uh, the metrics. Last year, they were collected at the city works yard on, um, on Clark Street there. And I, I don't know the metrics if they had any from last year. But I would assume when we were doing it uh, just on my lawn, um, I don't know, several, I would guess at least a couple tons. So I don't know how heavy is an average pumpkin, 10 to 20 pounds, probably at least a thousand pumpkins, I would say were, were diverted to at least the second year anyway, when it was really uh, popular. And that was just on my lawn. I know you were doing it at your place in Sweeberg too, Brian. So, uh, you know, I, I'm sure between us and the other locations in Oxford that we were doing it, uh, I would guess between three to five tons or more of pumpkins were being diverted from uh, either composting or uh, landfill. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So I think you've already answered my question about what motivated you to save the pumpkins, but can you tell me why you think lots of other people should get in on pumpkin rescue? Well, I think it's, it, you know, it's something fairly easy to do. Um, and, and it just gets us thinking about these potential resources in our community, right? Like previously this would have just been thought of, or a lot of people think of this sort of thing as, as waste. It's like, okay, I have this pumpkin, I'm done with it. Away it goes. So either in their garbage or in their compost or to the works yard, but it, it gets us starting to be more critical about what we consider to be waste and what we could also consider to be a resource, right? Because these these things can obviously be resources in a number of ways, whether, as you said, it's food for humans, food for animals, or uh, the um, the last option is, is as compost, which also is is a resource too, right? So um, certainly it should not be even thought of as being garbage or waste that should be one of those three resources, right? Mm -hmm. And in our last episode, Tom, you weren't here for it, but we did discover how much worms love anything in the pumpkin squash melon family. So you're absolutely right on that. Some people, though, think that only pie pumpkins are food 
are that pumpkin soup is made from a different kind of pumpkin than pumpkin you might bake. Do, do you have to match pumpkins to their final use? Can you eat white pumpkins, the ghost pumpkins? Yeah, you can. Some white pumpkins have like a darker orange flesh. Some have more of like a light green flesh. Uh, sort of greeny white. Um, you can eat any of them. I would say some are certainly more palatable than others. Uh, but it, interestingly enough, my mom is uh, she's a baker, so she makes pies. But she would always cook the pumpkins from when you know we did Halloween as kids. Even now, if she'll have pumpkins of of any type, pie pumpkins or otherwise, and uh, the pie that she made out of like the jack o' lantern pumpkins, the bigger ones. It was never as uh, creamy as the um, pie pumpkin pie, but one of my dad's friends got to really like this pie, and he actually called it lumpkin pie because it had more, <laughs> more lumps in the pie. So it became waiting every Halloween for a lumpkin pie rather than a pumpkin pie. But yes, they are all edible. Some, I would say, are more palatable, but uh, with a little bit of creativity, I'm sure um, anybody can make them taste pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, so um, people may know, and uh, Carrie's posted or will be posting, Whisper Gardener put together um, and circulated a, a recipe book for pumpkin and squash. And MJ O'Brien, um, who's a sometime member of some other groups around here, um, got her church involved. What do you think, Tom, of the idea of a church that collects like a dozen large pumpkins, cooks them, tags their flesh, and then uses them up bit by bit for people in need? comfort others in grief or to use as a fundraiser do you think those are all fair game i i would say so yes you know anything we can do to divert them but uh to help support people in our community is a is a great thing um yeah i i've reached out to some other resources sometimes uh i think people are a little bit apprehensive because they just don't really understand uh what we're trying to do and then it's just free that there's no strings attached that we're just trying to do things to um divert waste and and you know use these resources in our community and just do things to try and improve our uh, community as well can you see any ways that community groups could scale this up and do it with larger numbers how would that help a community save them money yeah you know i think uh you're doing a lot of that stuff already brian helping uh to join different groups together and and uh, get this idea to have a little bit more traction within the county <clears throat> and beyond but um uh the more people that know about it the more hopefully we'll get involved and and who knows what could happen in the future you know it could be something uh maybe just beyond collection maybe there's some sort of event that happens after where you process it and it uh, gets distributed to different um uh you know organizations within the community which can utilize that i like that idea tom volunteers put your name in the chat box we'll get you together on that one um i'm guessing tom that you know some farmers who've used pumpkins for fodder uh, you're a farmer i'm not what creatures like pumpkin squash and gourds well, I know that um, the one of the main farmers that was getting it was uh, Carl uh, up at Greener Pastures Eco Farm, um, and he was feeding it to his pigs. So every once in a while, he'd crack open a pumpkin or several, and uh, he was the main recipient of at least the Woodstock uh, pumpkin drop off. Uh, so yeah, I think that he said the pigs really, really enjoyed them. So I don't know if they were close to being finished as you would say but uh, a pumpkin uh, finished pig uh, for Christmas probably would be a pretty good uh, or ham I guess you could say would be a pretty delicious thing I would guess mm. what would make you reject a pumpkin for use either as food or fodder um, so some of the things that we did receive sometimes we asked for no rotten pumpkins um, sometimes you know if they've been sitting on your step for a month or if they were uh, uh, carved say two weeks before Halloween or something like that, you know, they start to go black and green and mushy. Um, those ones are are better destined strictly for the compost heap. Uh, but sometimes people would also donate uh, pumpkins that had been uh, painted as well or had other decorations of plastic and things maybe, uh, you know, stuck in them. And um, we just asked the for no painted pumpkins. Unfortunately, you know, for the pigs, those couldn't uh, really be digested. And uh, also, if there were a lot of 
candle wax in there, either just remove the candle wax. Um, the farmer said a tiny little bit wouldn't be a deal, a big deal, but uh, you know, we didn't want any pumpkins that were already half rotten uh, or were sort of tarnished with paint or candle wax. Mm -hmm. Some people really get into excess. They buy like 20 pumpkins, line their walkway, their porch, put them around their lamp posts. Are, are you like them? Do you believe excess is beauty? Or are you more in favor of one pumpkin per person? Well, I, I think it's that's uh, that's up to the person who got the pumpkins. I I don't care too much. I don't mind a few pumpkins on the uh, step. My wife is uh, more of the uh, she's sort of a go big or go home type person sometimes. But um, I would say you know it, it doesn't matter too much. The the pumpkins are grown right. It's I don't think they're uh, whether whether someone buys them or someone doesn't, there's going to be pumpkins somewhere. So uh, I think as long as they find the proper home after people are done with them, then that's um, sort of the most important thing. Mm. So we know that food costs are rising. Doesn't it makes a lot of sense then to cook and preserve as much as you can and reduce buying other kinds of food and reduce buying decorations. But if you serve too much pumpkin or squash, it's going to seem kind of repetitive. What's a really, really extraordinary way that you would serve pumpkin to kids, maybe Chris's kids, so that nobody would say, but dad, you ate me, made me eat pumpkin for the last five days and three times some of those days. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I do like a pumpkin soup uh, often, sort of like a curried pumpkin soup with coconut milk is pretty good. Um, sometimes I'll do like a starchy root vegetable bake with potatoes and onions and carrots, and we'll put squash in there too, or pumpkin. Um, I'm sure you could probably pumpkin pie. My mom's pumpkin pie is the best around. So that is one that I always, uh, enjoy. And I'm sure you could squeeze it into a lot of different desserts to appease the kids, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was going to ask you the next question about locations for, um, depositing pumpkins, but I see that Carrie's beat me to the punch and she's posted outside. Um, uh, so maybe what I'll do is I'll just uh, mention that people can find a recipe booklet um, that Whisper pulled together, Whisper Gardener, a former member of uh, Future Oxford, and Margaret's Muffins recipe. It was circulating on Facebook page and uh, a year ago, Radio stations all over the southwestern Ontario covered our pumpkin things. So, Tom, did you want a last word? I I don't think so, really. Let's just uh, let's see if okay. we can get even more pumpkins than last year. Yeah, I'm fairly sure that we're going to call on you at some point during the question. So, thank you. I'm waiting for some people to try those recipes um, that have been posted, and then. Uh, Maybe to invite me over to help them with, uh, try them too. Margaret already did that, so there's the challenge. Now turning to something that's not so squash specific, we have Danine Jones who hauls cartloads of food of all sorts from food producers to food access providers. So Janine, what is Food Forward Oxford? Mm, so Food Forward Oxford is a beautiful program that is um, sponsored by the United Way Oxford. Um, based at Women's Employment Resource Center downtown um, in Woodstock. And essentially what I do is I source excess food, food that would go into waste, um, anything that would be discarded or like a surplus at um, a local farm. Um, then I take that food and I pick it up and I deliver it to food access providers around Oxford County, giving it back to people in need. So it could be anything from housing insecure, or it could be a large family that's just um, struggling at the point in time because of um, just for different changes within COVID restrictions, um, the lost wages and this and that, and the rising cost of food that we have right now, which is, it's increasing. So um, yeah, so essentially that's what I do. I take excess food and I distribute it as fast as I can go. Hmm? All right, so I think you've addressed this question in part, but any pieces you feel you want to answer yet, tell us what excess food is and tell us why it's doubly, if not triply important now to rescue it. Mm, so excess food, there is a major epidemic about everybody always throwing out food that is listed as best before date. 
So uh, the understanding of best before date for some people, they think it's expired, but it's actually not. Um, there is a regulation in Canada that says that certain foods can be good for anywhere three to six months, sometimes a year, depending on what it is. Um, I mean, if it's frozen dairy, you can freeze it at the best before date, which is great. Um, but again, you'd have to flip that out within a couple of weeks to a month um, for it to be consumed. Um, so again, going back to the idea of the best before, I rescue best before date food before it goes to landfill when it still has beautiful nutritional value and give it back to people in need. Who's contributing this food? Can you give us some examples of the kinds of sources and then where's the food going to? Mm, that's a fun one. So we have expanded a lot. Um, we started when I started the program uh, back when I started with the program last year in November, I came on board and I had A&W and Shoppers Drug Mart within um, Oxford County. And a lot of that food was at best before. So we had soups and um, it would be frozen hamburgers and French fries. Um, and then recently we got apple pie. So we turn those into the meals for the community tables. It cycles for life. It's one good one. Um, downtown three times a week. We make meals um, for anybody that wants to come in and they essentially get a Ziploc bag, pre-cooked burgers and French fries and take it home. It's already pre-cooked. It's much easier for them to eat it. Um, then other people that have just come on board, Foodland in Woodstock just came on board um, and they are donating anything that was at best before. And we had, um, you know, cheese balls, um, cheese, what do you call them? Che um, for kids, you know, the bags of chips, cheese balls <laughs> with those big tubs. We got tons of those. Um, but then a lot of yogurt and juice and everything before it, it hit best before he threw it in the freezer. We rescued that. I take it back to my office and then I distribute it out to different um, providers. So some of it would go to a community table where people could eat the smaller containers of yogurt um, just with the spoon, like a personal size. And then the larger tubs, we've donated those to um, Lunch Bunch, um, Sub Club and um, some other community centers. Um, Sherry McKnight is one of them um, giving food back to them so they can make the yogurt into um, things like a topping for a quesadilla or adding yogurt to a curry or adding it to another recipe. So it opens up different avenues depending on what we get and it's changing all the time. Another good one, um, 5,000 liters of eggnog. <laughs> that was last Christmas. That was fun. <laughs> we were only able to actually um, take 1700 liters of eggnog. Um, and uh, there was a lot of car loads, but we did distribute it as fast as we could. And we had a one week turnaround before best before. So it was kind of, it was kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anybody yeah, listening? I, I, I probably so. picked some. Oh, we got Harvey's too. Forgot about that. Yeah. We got Harvey's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a real spread and some farms as well. So a real spread oh. in, in um, the kinds of places offering the food. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Well, it, it's 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 very diverse. We have to get cultural foods. We have Indian grocer that's local, which is fantastic. We picked up tons of curries today. And then again, coming back, it's not just retailers. It is farms. So Thames River Melons. Um, it's funny that we talked about greener pastures previously. Um, we haven't specifically had a donation from them, but we have had a &W rescued lettuce that came in large heads, but the centers were still attached to the lettuce. So after we used up the good parts of the lettuce, we took the squishy parts that were kind of turning and then the, the I call them the butts of the lettuce. We actually delivered those to the piggies as well. And they had that for snack time. And um, I got to be friends with Pumba before he became bacon. And that was, that was a sad <laughs> day, but <laughs> he did really enjoy that lettuce for a while. Right. So the, the bacon's in the crowd are now <laughs> upset. But anyways, um, so um, do you just want to talk a little bit about how um, how people know this excess food is available to their organization? So how does it get to them? I deliver it. So, uh, I mean, essentially, if they wanted to reach out to our website, I think we're going to touch that. Um, we have that up and running now. It's uh, foodfurteroxford.com. Or you can contact me through Women's Employment Resource Center. If you have excess food, Contact me, find me, um, find us on the website or the Facebook Food Forward Oxford um, on our Facebook site. Uh, there should be a direct link on our website as well. But you can use that and contact me directly. I have sources for um, all of my food access providers in Oxford County. 
I can take whatever they have if there's a donation and distribute it. And if they are, if somebody's looking for a place to have a community meal, or if they're just looking to get some groceries to fill up the void of whatever um, they couldn't purchase that month because they had to pay rent, um, I can give you direction as to community tables around the area and help you out that way. Yeah, so I'll ask this question in case there's any more answers for you want to give because you were ahead of me, which isn't hard. <laughs> So tell me about the impact your work has um, by diverting food on the people who end up eating the food. Are we just filling their bellies or is there more to it? Oh, there's a lot more to it. So, I mean, there's options like food bank and, and people that can go to these community tables and resource the food. But when we take the excess food um, that are coming from farms, there's more nutrition. And the faster I get on it, the nutritional value is increasing. So it's improving not only, fill, not just filling their bellies, but it's improving their health. Not to mention we're diverting tons of waste um, from landfill, um, which is essentially what we really want to do. We want to reduce food waste and reduce food cost for people. So we have an increased community feeling. Everybody's able to focus um, their efforts on, like if they're, if they're in a vul vulnerable community, they can feel better about having to pay for things for their children or paying their rent or paying their bills and then being able to take that food and still have a full tummy, but also nutritional value for their health. Yeah. And what about those organizations that answer your calls when you say, Hey, I have lots of milk today. Who can use it? Or when you say onions, who wants onions? What does this do for those organizations? Um, specific. Okay. We're talking about, um, now let me rephrase it. I had a, a funny feeling about this one. Okay. The organizations that answer the calls, hey, I have lots of milk today. Are we talking about the organizations that are on the receiving end or the ones that are donating? The ones that you are that you are donating to, the ones who are receiving. <laughs> well, they can definitely expand their cooking capabilities when it comes to ingredients. Onions specifically, um, believe it or not, Thanksgiving's coming up and I get to use all the buckets of onions I have rescued from A&W. <laughs> So I've been kind of hoarding some buckets. Um, so that opens up that avenue. Uh, then simple things like uh, beans. If we have a lot of rescue of beans and black beans have been in the surplus at our center, um, but a lot of people haven't been picking them up and they haven't taken them. So what I do is I supply um, recipes. So we black bean quesadillas, and then you can add a little bit of chicken and double your protein value. It's amazing. Um, depending on what comes in, eggnog at Christmas was a little bit more simplified. Um, I think we had some people talking about, what was the solution? I believe it was you, Brian. Didn't you say something about using eggnog for a recipe? Or maybe it was. Well, yeah, I have, an, I have somebody I know who substituted eggnog for milk in muffin recipes. That, okay, then that would, that's fantastic. Yeah, so the muffins came out pre-spiced because eggnog has usually right. some in it too. Yeah. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I asked this question of Tom. I'll ask you a similar question. Um, can you give an idea of the quantities of food that are reaching the less for, uh, fortunate? Thanks. Um, there's a, a wide range of you. Oh, okay, I um, you cut out there for a minute, so I thought you were done. Sorry. Um, the food. Uh, okay, so, well, let's go back to cycles of life. That table is a really good example. Um, there are three times a week in um, here in Woodstock, two times a week in other locations, and I believe they've started out. I was giving meals at approximately like the donations coming from Harvey's and a and W um, meals specifically started anywhere between 17 to 25. When I started in November of last year, now I am getting up with donations about 78 at a time each time. And the table is having 130 people attending instead of 50. So we have pretty much tripled our efforts um, with what the food is coming in to match the demand and I still can't keep up with it. It's still higher in demand. We're still having shortages at the table. We, we can't even, I can't even get enough. Where I just noticed last week that there was a, a protein um, shortage. Like there was a little bit um, less on some of the tables. So now I'm advocately, I'm trying to get, if the, um, I hope Swiss Chalet hears this cause I really want Swiss Chalet to come on board. That would be another one I've been trying to get to. I want those chickens. <laughs> Anyway, um, and mm. uh, yeah, um, what was I going to say? Okay, so um, we've tripled essentially with all of our reports that we're we do file reports with the United Way, Oxford, and um, we've essentially tripled our efforts in the amount of meals that we're producing for people. Um, 
and tripled the efforts that you're uh, the efforts you tripled the provision of food to people. And if you weren't doing this, where would this food be going? Garbage. People would be throwing it out. And right. unfortunate food. Okay, a good example. Look at Foodland. Foodland came on board two weeks ago. The first week we had 104 pounds of food. Last week we had 202 pounds of food, and it was gone. Like I, I was able to get rid of it within 24 hours, and right. it was gone. And it's, it's already in people's bellies. So I'm excited to see what's going to come in on Wednesday. Mm. Mm. It's going to be great. How would people, how would people contact you if they're producing excess food? or if their community organization is looking for food to provide mm -hmm. meals to people. Okay, foodfordoxford.com is live now. You can contact me through the website. You can also um, click on the link on that website or go on Facebook directly to our Food Ford Oxford link. You can also reach out with the United Way Oxford. They can contact me directly. Um, alternatively, you can contact me at Women's Employment Resource Center and uh, you can make that phone call or send me a direct email to Janine at work.com. It's as simple as that. It is that simple. That's it. And I'm always around. I'm usually in my car. So somebody can always get a hold of me. If you look it up on the internet, you should be able to find us. Right. And I suspect there's really quite a lot of work in this for you. And that there's some surprises <laughs> about the sudden availability of food. Any big surprises that you want to talk about? Yeah, we got waffles today. <laughs> we, got waffles. <laughs> we filled five freezers full of waffles. Mm -hmm. I had to sacrifice one bucket of onions um, to put in the fridge. So I'm hoping I can flip that before it totally thaws, but it's probably not going to happen. Um, but yeah, waffles today. That was the surprising. And to tell you the truth, we're picking up another skid of waffles tomorrow. So I'm still going to be on my phone until 10 o'clock tonight trying to find a recipient or somewhere to store them. Um, and I know it's going to get really busy. Thames River Melons have already told us that they're going to have probably delicata squash. Is it delicata? It's got the yeah. stripes on it. I love that squash. It's so good. So they're going to have a surplus of that coming soon. So it's nice to get that information coming from the farmers because it comes back to me and then I can say, okay, I'm going to line up who I can send it to. And I mean, we support everybody from like Ingamo to Dasso. Um, there's Cycles Left Table and Bullwinkles. Um, oh gosh, and I'm forgetting all of the other ones, but um, it, it's essentially it, it, it creates the groundwork for me to set it up ahead of time. And Thank you so uh, much, Janine, for this work. A last okay. question mm -hmm. What would you do with a bag of donated coal rabi or a bag of celeriac, celery yeah. roots? Oh, celery root. That would be difficult. I would probably include recipes. And give it out some to the community tables for people that do have kitchens and the ability to cook it. But although kohlrabi is fantastic, slice it really thin with a little bit of salt. It's awesome. I learned this from my Mennonite friends. And um, the celery root, uh, I love that too. Slice it and roast it in the oven with just a little bit of salt, salt and pepper and some seasoning. It's amazing. Mm. But always provide recipes. If people don't know what to do with it, help them out. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you so much. I'll turn it over to Carrie. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Janine. That was great. Before you leave, Janine, there's a question in the chat I'd like to address. Um, okay. It says, Janine, you're providing an incredible service. Where do the resources come from to provide infrastructure and funding to keep the program going? The um, funding infrastructure that comes from Food Forward Oxford, or not Food Forward, sorry, um, Oxford, United Way Oxford. They funded the initial program as a pilot two years ago. Um, and then it's based out of Women's Employment Resource Center, who provides me um, a office, even though I'm hardly ever in it. And then um, we also used it as um, that program and the funding from them as leverage to go to the um, Oxford County um, community um, to get the Maple Leaf Grant for the fridges and freezers that we have on site. It kind of broadens our abilities to be able to do what we do. And I've, I've even got carts and um, push carts and coolers. Oh, coolers are the biggest thing too that we had to have just to be able to distribute the meals um, during the hot months. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> we really appreciate it. And there'll be time uh, later for questions if other people have them to address them. So thanks so much, Janine, for right. joining us. Thank you. And now we also, um, oh, thanks. Oh, I have something else to say before that. Uh, it's so great um, to hear that there's local restaurants and grocery stores in our community that's repurposing food rather than it ending up in dumpsters. 
Um, so it sounds like there's some really um, great action going on with Food Forward Oxford, and it's really wonderful to hear. I can't wait to see um, that this becomes the norm rather yeah. than the exception to the rule yeah. in our community. Um, so let's um, so let's move on to our next guest. Um, we have Holly. Holly Brown is from the Oxford County Library System, and another great way to cook up local food from the farmer's market, including vegetables you might not have heard of, about until today, um, is to check out a cookbook from your local library. My card, I know, gets a lot of a workout with the great options that they have available. Um, so welcome, Holly. Thanks so much Hi. for joining us. And uh, can you tell us about the library's collection of cookbooks or resources that people can use to reduce food waste at home? Absolutely. Um, good evening, everybody. So apologize, my voice is a little hoarse, so I will. Uh, I might need to take some breaks and take a sip of tea. Um, so we have lots of uh, recipe books available at the library, but a quick search just for food waste in our catalog shows that we have a lot of recipe books specific to zero waste lifestyle or reducing waste. I'm going to rhyme off a few titles and I'll put those in the chat. Carrie's already put a couple in there. Um, we have the Waste Free Kitchen Handbook. A guide to eating well and saving money. Cook more, waste less, zero waste recipes to use up groceries, tackle food scraps, and transform leftovers. Uh, scraps, wilt, and weeds, which I have here with me, turning food waste into plenty, which breaks it down into sections. So there's a section on apples and how to use the cores, the peels, all the pieces of an apple, a section on pumpkins, how to make pumpkin jerky, pumpkin pie candy, the seeds, pumpkin powder. Um, so lots of ways to experiment. Uh, the Zero Waste Chef, which I think Carrie has borrowed right now. Oh yeah, I have this one. If you want it from the library, too bad, it's mine for right now. You'll have to wait till I return it. The Zero Waste Chef, uh, Anne-Marie Bruno, uh, Bruno, rather, um, she has lots of great recipes and it's got a whole lot of things from like, even simple things on how to make vegetable broth um, to, like different seasons, like what to do in the winter with certain fruits and veggies. And it's great. This one's super awesome too. So highly, highly recommended. And then we also have one that's called cooking of scraps. So turning your peels, core, rinds, and stems into delicious meals. So I highly uh, recommend everybody comes and gets a library card. And if you're looking to reduce some uh, food waste, check out our print collection. But we also have a lot of e-resources. So we have a resource called Press Reader. Um, which gives access to thousands of magazines. So if you're one of those people who likes to flip through and find recipes and magazines, you can access thousands of magazines around the globe uh, through Press Reader with your library card, and that's totally free. Uh, I do also know that September is uh, get your own library card month too. So this would be a good opportunity for those people that maybe have moved to the county recently um, and, uh, have not got a library card to revisit their local libraries and see what's available, right, Holly? Yes, and there's actually a contest now. If you have a friend who doesn't have a library card and you refer them, you can get entered into our contest to win a prize for referring your friend to come uh, join us at the library and use our resources. Super nice. That's great. So um, for people looking to save a delicious harvest that's happening right now. I know like all of the squash is just coming off, but there's also been tons of delicious local produce or people learning to preserve food for a later use. Are there other items that patrons may borrow from the library system? Absolutely. So we do have lots of canning books. One of my favorites is Not Your Mama's Canning Book. Um, but to help you with your canning, we actually are not just books at the library. We have a lot of cool things to borrow, and that includes our kitchen library. Um, so sometimes kitchen equipment can be expensive, or maybe you only use it seasonally, like a lot of canning equipment and those kind of things. So you can borrow those things from the library. We have canning sets, silicone molds that you can use to freeze herbs um, from your garden and oil in order to preserve them in your freezer. Uh, we have a dehydrator if you want to make some fruit leather for your next hike, uh, juicers, slow cookers, um, really large stock pots if you want to make a big batch of vegetable broth, um, and even things like cherry pitters, small things like that that maybe you're only going to use after you do a big uh, glean of a cherry field. Um, so there's lots of resources that aren't books at the library. We have a whole section of our uh, website, www.ocl.net, 
called Cool Things to Borrow that I recommend you check out to see that the library is not just books and print resources, but a lot of things that can help you extend your harvest or process a glean or um, do something with all that zucchini, right? If, you're, if you've been growing that at home. If only, not a good year for zucchini, I think, but, <laughs> but usually that is the thing, right? Um, now, is that for all ages? Would it be the right age for people to use as adult only? Is there a recommended age for the lending library? So, um, we do have some restrictions. Um, we welcome all ages to get a library card um, and depending on the age that's on that card, it will show you what is a, what you can borrow and what you cannot. Um, but a lot of those kitchen library things are great to use as the, for the whole family. We have a lot of cookie cutters and cake pans um, and even things like Star Wars popsicle molds. Um, so you could take some of those if you have some blueberries or something going off and throw them in a popsicle um, with your children to use. Um, and we also even have a children's ebook called Don't Waste Your Food, which talks about food waste and managing it with kids. Excellent. We'll have to try to find that resource and add that to the chat. That's great. Or pumpkin pops. Is that a thing? Pumpkin popsicles. It can be now. Uh, so, yeah. so Holly, if next spring um, our viewers want to start planting a garden, or uh, put a part of their yard into seed or um, plant something in planters on their balcony, what library collection could help them do that? So um, our largest branches, Tilsonburg and Ingersoll have seed libraries. We've reclaimed some of those old card catalogs you might've remembered and filled them up with seeds that you can um, borrow, grow, reap and return to the library. So. I'll hold up a few examples of what they look like. So you can come to the library and borrow a couple packets of seeds to try. Um, a great thing to do as a family to kind of learn how to grow or if you want to try a new variety. They are all open pollinated heirloom seeds um, and we have a great collection. Um, some of the things I have here are some really fun things like pink, pink popcorn makes really small pink popcorn kernels that I like to grow with kids. Um, we have some heirloom Canadian beans. This is a bush bean called Canadian Wonder that dates back to 1873 that you can borrow and grow. Um, or um, I know Janine said she liked delicata squash. There's a delicata called Honey Boat that's even a sweeter one um, that you can borrow from the library and grow. So we do ask our patrons, try these out and we hope that some receipts will return to us. Um, so you, if you do have something um, grow an abundance in your garden that you can bring it back and share with the community um, to increase food security uh, for people to learn that uh, how to garden and how to grow things and how to save seed. Um, and we're here to support you in that process at the library. Awesome. That sounds like a lot of fun. I know I've started doing seed saving in the last couple of years, mostly peppers and tomato seeds, um, but I've got arugula seeds and I tried to save broccoli seeds this year until I talked to my sister-in-law who gave me the broccoli plant and realized it was a hybrid. So no dice on that one, but that's okay. So learned, learned our lesson, keeping those heirloom seeds. Um, are there other ways, Holly, that Oxford County Library Systems is reducing food waste or by helping distribute food to community groups or anything else you'd like to share? Um, so in Ingersoll and Tilsonburg Branch, we have tower gardens um, that we've purchased that sit in uh, periodically in our children's section and are growing some of the items in our seed library. So you can see what some of those are like. Uh, we've been growing lettuce and arugula here and then donating that to the food bank. Um, and I can't share too much about it, but um, Tilsonburg got, uh, received a Healthy Communities Initiative grant. Um, we are gonna be making a children's garden um, in Library Park behind us and using that as an edu edu educational space about um, heirloom plants and plants for pollinators and, and edible plants and, and hoping to use that as a tool to teach children about how to eat lots of the plants and, um, and all parts of the plants and, and where their food is coming from as well. Excellent. Uh, thanks so much, Holly. We really appreciate your chat. Um, and we're gonna bring some other people in for questions. Um, so we're gonna go to the chat and this is the time now to, if you would like to um, be on screen or be recorded, uh, for your questions, this is the time we will pause um, our recording at the end. And if you want to save your questions later, that is fine too, or put them into the chat that we can ask on your behalf. Um, there was a question 
that um, someone was asking if the seed lending library was offered at the Woodstock Public Library, which I believe it is. So um, I know the Woodstock Public Library is not the same system as the Oxford County system. However, um, I do believe they have one. So uh, mywpl.ca is the Woodstock Public Library webpage to check that out. Um, and of course, for all of the other Oxford County Library system um, branches throughout, the rest of them you can go see at ocl.net for your website. Yes, Holly? So yes. That, so yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, oh, apparently Tom Butler, our guest, has helped set up the Woodstock Seed Library. Thank you, Tom. So very good. All right. So this is this is wonderful. Um, also, there are several places where people could collect pumpkin and squash seeds to keep for themselves and contribute to the seed library collections at this time of year, um, as we know. Uh, great. So I'm just going to. Pull Brian back in here too. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes. So in fact, um, there's a really interesting idea that's in the chat, um, and it's, it's a historical idea. And um, that conversation has restarted. And I'd be very happy to hear that we have more people interested in gleaning. Gleaning just means that you go and you collect excess food um, from gardens with permission from farms with permission um and in some places even boulevard trees instead of just being shade trees are fruit trees but you'd need people to, to pick otherwise you'd get wasps around them and some people with allergies would have a an issue with that um so that would be a, a super thing to do we had some questions too when we posted the ads and so some people were asking um um about curbside pickup of organic waste, um, which ultimately everything we've talked about here today is to really put an end to that um, and the necessity for that. But ultimately, there will still be some um, curbside waste. Not everybody believes you can eat the pumpkin rind, but I have a cookbook that says you should spray it in with your pumpkin. But if you're one of the people that does that, um, so people were asking about uh, the kind of wheelie bins, green bins they're called in some places. Um, and why urban centers in Oxford County don't have that. So principally um, Woodstock. Um, and actually the province is in the process of mandating that across uh, the province for any community above 50,000. Woodstock is planning towards that. So it's coming there. It'll also be standardized about what gets recycled and what gets used in organic waste. There'll be a whole lot easier to think that if you live in a place like I do, uh, where, which most people don't even know where it is. It's a rural place. Um, it doesn't make sense for somebody to come by in a truck and pick up waste because it's going to cost money to run that truck. It's going to cost fuel to run that truck. There are going to be emissions that outdo the environmental gain of that waste. Um, however, because I live in a rural place, I have lots of opportunities for green cones or composters, like in our last episode. Um, that we talked about. So um, there are multiple solutions. Somebody else asked um, about on a condo, uh, could you do something with organic waste? And the answer to that is um, a very strong yes, because we have a pilot project of that. Um, and the advantage of anybody who lives in a home that's their own or a duplex that they own some of the property or rights to the property or a condo corporation where ultimately the residents own the property adjoining to it is they can do those things and um, we have a very exciting pilot project happening about that as well. So um, if anybody else wants to jump in with a question, we could at this point just take maybe two or three if um, and we'll know that you want to ask a question when you um, unmute or maybe wave at us um, and then we'll get Holly or me. Yeah, Brian, we'll get to that in, uh, in a quick second too. Since Tom Butler is still here, um, I think we'll ask him about the the seed library, you did mention it in the chat, but just for those people, um, Tom, do you have a second to address the Woodstock Public Library seed lending program or anything to share about that? Sure. Um, yeah, it. Uh, there are plenty of seed libraries across the country. I'm, I don't know the number on that exactly, but um, what they are, they're just, uh, typically they're set up at local libraries. They can be in different spots, but all it is is you can go in the springtime and there are a selection of seeds that have typically been donated by uh, your local gardeners and people in the community. And uh, the idea is you take a sample of seeds, you grow that plant out, you try your hand at saving seeds from the plant, 
i.e. tomatoes. And then when you harvest your seeds or a portion of the plants that you grew at the end of the year, you then return a sample of seeds or uh, numerous samples of seeds to the seed library to, uh, or to the library um, to, you know, proliferate the seeds and make sure that they, uh, uh, the, their stock is replenished at the end of the year. Yeah, so they're um, getting the next generation of seeds. That's wonderful. Next, next generation of seeds. Yeah, exactly. And the, um, I did hear that the Salvation Army did a program as well called Grow a Row. And so it was people that had extra food in their own personal home gardens to donate it to the food bank as well um, through them. So um, there's lots of community programs around where either seeds or growing um, the, the, hort the horticultural societies locally too. a lot of them are keeners on this, which is great. So if you know any of those people make friends with them for sure. Thanks, Tom. Um, we've had Holly and um, Megan Brennan also has been our tech support from the Oxford County Library System. So thank you, Megan. Um, we have um, some resources from the library system that Holly and Megan have added into the chat. So thank you very much for that. You can scroll if you're not familiar with the chat function so much, you can scroll back to be able to look at everyone's messages and resources that were added there. I believe it's also recorded with our recording as well, too. So. You should be able to scroll back and see. You can also copy and paste um, some of the resources uh, yourself from the chat function if you wanted to keep those. Excellent. Did anyone else have questions they wanted to come on screen with? You can show a hand or talk with us now, and then we'll close up if not. Okay, I think we'll go to the closing. And then we'll open it up for additional questions then. Okay. So question to Tom, Janine, and Holly. Not too long ago, someone who rescues cats told me she adds some cooked pumpkin to the meat she cooks for them, and that saves her money on cat food, and apparently it's good for cats. What other astonishing use for excess food can you think that might save some people money, improve the quality of their lives? And a cat would improve the quality of life anyways, but doesn't have to include cats. Want to take a stab at that? We'll go with um, maybe Tom first. We'll put him on the spot and we'll give Janine and Holly a second to think on it. Uh, extra food? Well, I guess invite your friends over for dinner. Why not, right? Just uh, <laughs> the, I'll be there. I'll the, more be there. We, the more we get to happy or together, the happier we'll be. I agree with that. Janine, an idea? Janine, you're on, still on mute. Sorry. Whoopsie. Um, there we are. Okay, well, I did things myself. The pumpkin rescue, I roast my pumpkin for myself. Um, I like his idea as well of inviting people over for dinner. Um, you could always make extra meals and take those meals and donate them to these community tables. There's an idea too. If you have a really good hand and you want to maybe give back to your community, that's a great, great way to do it. Um, another thing I do that with the herbs every year, especially basil, cause I love basil, um, for pesto. I always make it into ice cubes and I freeze a ton of batches in my freezer for the duration of winter. Um, yeah, that's it. Hey, and okay. Holly, you have an amazing use for excess food. I think getting inventive, um, getting inventive of your preservation, whether you can think of creative ways to use those scraps in. Christmas gifts or, or gifts to families or mm -hmm. household cleaners, right? Um, in this book, I was just looking at scraps, wilt, and weeds. They talk about taking, if you're making apple pie and you end up with all these apple peels, making apple peel tea. Or you can use your orange peels and lemon rinds in order to make uh, cleaners, or your apple cores in order to make apple cider vinegar. So just um, thinking about those things that you might be putting in the compost or the or the trash that that could have other purposes within your home or or even get um, fashioned as, into some nice uh, fragrant apple peel tea um, with some other spices in that that you could give as a Christmas gift or mm -hmm. holiday gift. People sometimes accuse me of going dark, and I'm going to do that. And I'm not really wanting to stoke fear, but we keep hearing that California's ability to Oops, go all the food in yeah, that rhymes with drought. Um, so how would each of you suggest that we solve this on both an individual and a community basis? I'll go to Holly first. 
Brian, do you mind um your cutout? Do you want to ever just repeat yeah. your question? Sure. Sorry about that. Yeah. So it's about um if California can no longer ship the quantities of food north that we're so used to, what can we do individually or as a community so that we won't have food shortages this winter? Distribution. I really want to empower, you know, families and individuals to start growing a little bit at home. Um, mm -hmm. I've always been a big supporter of like food not lawns um, and, 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 and growing some of those things, even in the tiniest spaces. Um, I think we can, can grow some food to support ourselves. And I'm also such a huge supporter of Tilsonburg. Um, uh, I work in Tilsonburg branch and there's such an amazing community garden here. Um, mm -hmm. and, and really uplifting and supporting those community spaces where people are growing and learning and, and, sh and there's such places of sharing, um, yeah. as well. I think that's, that's, uh, you know, teaching people and educating people about that. Everyone can grow some things. Like, even if you think of the, a black thumb, it's possible. Yeah. Janine, when those like crispy cucumber flavored strawberries don't come up from California in, in February, what are we going to eat? It's kind of funny because it's similar to the Pedro and peppers that I have been looking for everywhere and I can't find them and I could only get them from Clippers Organics in Vancouver when I lived there. Um, I ordered the seeds and I grew them. Of course, um, I was very upset because I have a little possum that lives in my yard and he dug them all up as well as my sorrel. <laughs> so I didn't get to it and I have to order more seeds. Um, uh, and I think that a lot of um, issue with food is all based on distribution. If it's not coming up, then let's produce it here. And then let's concentrate on distributing it evenly. And maybe um, it will find alternatives to that food in some of these um, locations, like from farmers and say, hey, you know what? We have a shortage of this. How about these farms um, start having community gardens or they could have um, the growth of the food and then we work on distribution, getting that across Canada. Mm -hmm. All right. I want to beat everybody. Nobody's posted in the chat a recipe for possum pie yet. So we haven't <laughs> solved that problem. Tom, in terms of the food coming up from the States, our addiction to red peppers in, in I don't know, in March, um, what would you suggest? Well, I think, uh, you know, we have become so accustomed to eating outside of our seasonal, uh, you know, food that is available. So, it would probably be hard for a lot of people, but we may have to start going back to uh, eating seasonally. You know, in the summertime, there's a lot of an abundance, but uh, in the wintertime, maybe a little bit less abundance. There can still be tons of variety, but it's a lot more starchy storage crops. So, you know, there, there, there might be something of, of needing to shift our diets towards these storage crops that we can grow around here that store a long time. Uh, but I think part of it too is certainly learning how to preserve our own food and uh, supporting local farmers because you know if if more people support local farmers then they're going to plant more the next year because they had a, a good year and then we'll you know have a more robust um, local food system that can support more um, people in in our immediate community. And that too would be a good thing. Over to Carrie. Uh, thanks, Brian. Well, I get the last word um, and to thank everyone so much for coming. Um, Brian, my co-host, and of course, um, it's addressed to you, dear listeners. Um, thank you for watching, adding your input. And to our guests, Tom Butler, Janine Jones, Holly Brown, who spoke so well, and to Megan Brennan, our OCL, the Oxford County Library System team, as well as the communications staff at Oxford County, um, and all of our fellow members of Zero Waste Subcommittee of Future Oxford. Thank you so much. And to all who do the good work of preventing food waste and of diverting organics from the waste stream, we thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us and good night. Thank you. And we'll, we'll close down the recording now. And if anybody wants to have an off the record chat, um, once Megan gives us a thumb up, 